Marwan, even as I was listening to you, I was getting the information that we have a Hamas statement that has just been put out. And so I'm glad that I'm talking to you because I'd like to read it together and then get your uh, reaction to it. Here is the statement. Hamas has rejected allegations that it committed uh, crimes against women and children. These are, this is the quote, some Western media outlets continue to spread Zionist slander and lies about our Palestinian people and their resistance, which falsely and slanderously promoted allegations that members of the Palestinian resistance beheaded children and assaulted women without any evidence to support their lies and claims. Hamas strongly condemns the baseless allegations. Marwan, let's, let's talk a little bit about this. Um, this is significant because those, um, those ac accusations are something that have grown louder and louder over the last few days. Um, now, Hamas is clearly owning up to the fact that it killed, deliberately killed, um, hundreds and hundreds of Israelis. But it seems they're saying there's a red line and that we did not do. Okay, so let's start with the, with the latter part. There is no doubt, according, again, to the two scholars we just heard on Inside Story, that, Israel, that Hamas, Hamas is in breach of international humanitarian law, that the way it, it took its action uh, in Black Saturday uh, against Israeli civilians and so on and so forth is in breach of international law. There is no doubt about that. And it could be defined as a terrorist act. Did it behead children and rape women and so on and so forth? No, because the news that first came out from the Los Angeles Times have already been retracted. So now it's just being, uh, you know, used as uh, as fake information on the web. And of course, as you know, the web, especially under Musk, you never know, you know, how 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 it will uh, multiply and mutate throughout the world. But clearly, there was no beheading of children, and there is no such thing. But I think those who are trying to make the case for land invasion and for the annihilation not only of Hamas of the, or, or even of the Palestinian people as animals, they're the ones who are already equating the, you know, 7-10 with 9-11, right? They are saying that what happened to Israel is a 9-11. And Hamas is like Al-Qaeda. And Hamas behits children. And Hamas is trying to be slick like ISIS. And Hamas hates the Jews, and as Biden said, its sole reason for existence is to kill Jews. So already there is a demonizing process by Israel and its pundits and its neoconservative allies in the United States and elsewhere to make the case for a repeat of to the 2003 war or the 2011 invasion of Afghanistan, basically saying that Hamas is something like the United States has already experienced and we know what the result is. And hence, there is no diplomacy or peace with Hamas. Hamas has to be dismantled, and it has to be defeated, and it has to be ended. That kind of comparison is, first of all, wrong. Second, it is sensationalist. And third, it will lead to the wrong decisions. Because Hamas, unlike al-Qaeda, unlike ISIS, and so on and so forth, had a very particular nationalist agenda. And it never acted outside of the borders of Palestine. It didn't, doesn't have an international agenda. Hamas has always functioned within the parameters of historic Palestine. And even though it did take actions that are certainly could be defined as terrorist actions, this is a nationalist movement that used unsavory tactics, but they always stayed within the logic of resistance against what they call their occupiers of the past 55 years. And Marwan, I think, I think this is a really interesting and important point because Hamas has not spoken that much since the beginning of this war and what they have said, their statements so far um, have been about military things. Um, the, the bombardment of Gaza, uh, they publicly said that they would start killing um, people that they're holding captive if uh, targets, civilian targets in Gaza were hit without prior warning. That has been their communication so far. This statement the one that I just read you and that you've been talking about, tells us one very, very simple thing, in addition to everything you've just said, that Hamas cares about its public image. Yes, they have killed hundreds of people, and they clearly own up to that, but they're not denying it. Um, and they have claimed responsibility for that attack. There is zero doubt about that. But they care about their public image. 
Absolutely. Uh, you know, this is a nationalist movement that prides itself of being, uh, you know, the protector of, of its people, the representative of its people. Let's not forget that back in 2006, they won their legislative elections and uh, they have remained popular, although they're not as popular in Gaza, but they are more popular in the West Bank. So the fact that uh, their leaders have sacrificed once and again and they spend uh, decades in jail, uh, it's still appreciated by a certain segment of the Palestinian people. I'm not sure all Palestinian people support the action of last weekend. I'm not sure how many do. We haven't conducted any surveys. But I'll tell you what it is in the eyes of Hamas and its supporters. This was a collective suicide attack because all 14, 1,500 Hamas fighters that went in did not leave. Right? They've all been killed. So this is, in so many ways, a collective suicide attack that took with them more than a thousand Israelis or a thousand Israelis, which is all in by itself is, is just, of course, horrific and tragic. But at the end of the day, they have not bombed Israel from, from the air. They have not stayed safe. These people sacrificed their lives to kill civilians and soldiers and so on and so forth. So they are involved in logic, guerrilla logic, asymmetrical warfare logic of resistance against occupation. And they've said for years we've tried other ways and means. They did not work. And according to them, they are, this, they are left with no other option but to resist Israel with, uh, you know, with, with force, with violence. They took that decision, and now they're taking the responsibility for it. Unfortunately, a lot of people in Gaza, in addition to those in Israel, are paying the price. And I think, as you and I were speaking before Blinken um, you know, went on air, that the predictions about hundreds of thousands, perhaps uh, tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of casualties, of deaths in Gaza, of course, is something that we all in this world must stop, uh, must try to stop anyway. And to, to, to the last point about, uh, just before I forget, uh, which is the point about uh, safe passage, right? Because this, again, goes to your point on about Hamas. I'm not sure what do they mean by safe patches. So they can, uh, what, let out uh, a million Gazans into the Sinai? Where are they going to go in the Sinai? What are they going to do in the Sinai? I mean, what are you going to do exactly? Like ship out a million people to where? Cairo? And, and what, what guarantees that they will be uh, able to go back? Because the entire tragedy of this called Palestine started with the idea that Israelis threw them out and when they won't let them back in. So what guarantees, as soon as you make a safe passage, is that these Palestinians will be allowed to come back, not to their homes, mm. but to their alternative refugee camps and, and villages and so on and so forth in Gaza. Second, I'm not sure Hamas is going to allow it, because it's afraid of exactly that, expulsion. This will be a safe passage, right? But it's a pretext to expulsion, because that's what Israel does. It wants to ship as many people as possible. And third, no one in Palestine, including the Palestinian Authority and Hamas, do not want to make uh, Israel's job easier for is the Israeli army, right? Because now it's not exactly that they're hiding behind civilian population. They are part of the civilian population. This is not a professional army. They are the young men and women of Gaza, and they are fighting occupation. So their parents and grandparents and cousins are of, the, of these fighters and so on, they live there, right? So that's their families there. That's what makes this conflict, this asymmetrical conflict, so complicated and so tragic. And Israel knows that. And that's why we keep talking about the fact that there is no military solution to this. Even Hamas, once it's destroyed militarily and administratively, how are they going to destroy the idea of Hamas? The idea of Hamas is apparently more popular in the West Bank and in the Palestinian refuge camps than it is in Gaza. And once you destroy Hamas, how are you going to destroy the idea of Hamas in Gaza, which is the idea of resistance until justice is attained?